thank you all for joining us here at i80 sports where today we are giving you our way too early predictions for awards at the end of the year for the nhl as well as other news and notes around the league Thank you all for joining us again here at I-80 Sports. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe down below for more content such as this, as well as NFL, college football, and MLS coverage. And you can also join us at i80sports.com. And make sure you follow us on Twitter at I-80 underscore sports NHL. We are still climbing and climbing and climbing. We would love to hear more input from you guys because I do have a plan for this upcoming week, which I will reveal on Twitter. So make sure that you are linked to us on Twitter. Make sure you're following. I'm Brian. He's Tom. Tom, how are you doing today? Doing well. Uh, I guess we're in the, I guess the calm before the storm. I mean, Wednesday night, Wednesday night, full speed ahead, 113 straight days of hockey. And then we have the playoffs after that. So as long as everything goes according to plan, calm before the storm, but we know what's coming and it's a good thing. Hockey is officially back, and we couldn't be happier. It feels like we've been waiting forever for this NHL season to start, but it's finally starting this Wednesday night. And, Tom, I know I speak for both of us. I'm hyped. I am so excited for the season to start, and I'm chomping at the bit to start watching some NHL coverage for over 150 straight days it's going to be awesome i am so excited but we've got other things that we gotta dive into today because we are giving you our predictions for end of the year awards once we get to may as well as other news and notes around the league but let's start with those news and notes and we start with something more unfortunate and it i feel somber wearing this jersey today but understanding because throughout this week uh New New Jersey goaltender Corey Crawford uh, had announced that he was going to be out indefinitely for personal issues. Uh, There were floating reports of mental health issues as well as concussion problems, floating the idea around of maybe he's going to announce his retirement, and it came to pass. He has officially announced his retirement after 10 great years in the NHL as a member of the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, Tom, quick reaction. What's your thoughts of, of this it's sad it's really sad you know he um uh obviously wasn't the goaltender they broke the curse with but he was the goaltender of the dynasty he was on the starting goalie for two of the last three cup teams he was a fixture on team canada obviously price got the nod over him but he would get the nod in some games as well um it's just really really sad and um with the same thing happening with taves a few weeks prior i mean is it a strange coincidence or is there was, was there something going on in chicago after they won those cups that we don't know about that may get uncovered in the future. I, I I like to think not. I like to hope not. Strange coincidence, just him and Taves retiring. Like, not retiring. Taves is just out indefinitely. He's retiring. But you know, it's just weird. Both of them out for mental health issues, and now Crawford straight up up and retires. But what I don't understand is is that if you knew you were going to retire, if you knew all this was hanging on you, I don't understand why you would go sign a contract with a team that needed some veteran goaltending help and then just decide not to play. You know, I mean, you can make the case for Lundqvist, too, but Lundqvist had a heart condition that he just didn't know about. There's nothing he could have done about that. This, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's sad, but it's just there's a lot of there's a lot of red flags going off in my head here that, that, that there might be something more to this than we know right now. I think there's more to this than uh, than meets the eye. I think there is something underlying going on. I mean, this is a player who has dealt with off ice issues before I'm worried that that may be something that's popping up again. I hope not. And I certainly do not want to speculate and please for anybody that's listening, don't take that for any kind of, you know, real speculation. Cause that's just me, you know, saying some things based on his prior history. It's possible, but you know, certainly with the amount of injuries he's had over the course of his career, it's certainly understandable that he has chosen to, end his career on his own terms and certainly not go through with a season that he doesn't feel is up to a hundred percent for him. And I understand where he's coming from as a devil's fan. Yeah. I'm upset. I mean, it kind of stinks, 
you would have had a great tandem with Corey Crawford and Mackenzie Blackwood. Now Mackenzie Blackwood is going to be expected to take probably the majority of that playing time, which to be honest, I mean, my unpopular opinion is Mackenzie Blackwood doesn't get enough credit in this league. I think when you compare him to the likes of Carter Hart and Igor Shosturkin in terms of numbers, they match up very, very well. And they're all in the same rank. So I'm surprised that not enough people are talking about Mackenzie Blackwood coming into this season, but I'm hoping coming out of this season, more people are aware of how good Mackenzie Blackwood can be because as Devils fans saw, he is a real asset for the future. Now behind Mackenzie Blackwood right now is Scott Wedgwood and he has some NHL minutes logged ironically with the New Jersey Devils, even though he was not with the New Jersey Devils last year. He was with the Tampa Bay Lightning. He was not the primary backup for Andre Vasilevsky though. So, Wedgwood has had a little bit of time where he spent in the AHL. This will be his first real crack at being an NHL backup. And he has looked really well in training camp. It gives you some hope for this upcoming season. I don't think the Devils really need to get desperate and try to, you know, make a desperate move, trade assets to go and get somebody for behind Mackenzie Blackwood. I think you kind of hope that maybe after the season that is revealed to them as something that can happen. But, from us, you know, here at I-80 Sports to Corey, the Crow Crawf Crawford, happy retirement, well-deserved, and you had an illustrious and awesome career. Way to go. Now, turning our attention to the World Junior Finals, which happened this past week, and wow, what a World Junior uh, Championship it was. It was USA versus Canada. Tom, take us through exactly what happened in that game. Give us, you know, the play-by-play -play there. What stuck out to you in that? World Junior Cup final. I mean, it was the goaltending of Spencer Knight. I mean, Spencer Knight was echoing Mike Richter back in 1996 in that World Cup final. It just seemed like Knight took control of that game. Canada had that early onslaught there, and don't get me wrong. I remember, I believe it was Newhook who had come down and rang one off the post early. And I just remember saying, oh, no, we're going to be in for a long night here. And I just remember when the U.S. took control in that first period and they potted that first goal, you can tell Canada was on their heels. Canada had not given up an even strength goal the entire tournament, and now they were, and they, I don't, they hadn't trailed the whole tournament either. So now they had just given up the first even strength goal, and we're trailing for the first time. So now they're down one nothing, and I know at the end of the first period, okay, we're up one nothing, but I said this game has got a lot more to go. In my eyes, it might have been like the other USA Canada gold medal classics, like the overtime game in 2010, the shootout game in 2017, and even just the, you know, the quit, the the, the crazy comeback in uh, 2004. Um, but you want to know what? It didn't happen. The U.S. went up. Uh, Turcotte potted one there in the second period early. And it was just all U.S. after that. It was just defensive. It was a defensive shell. I was going crazy saying, you guys got to get another goal. Why are you sitting back? Why are you sitting back? But Knight just controlled the game. And I believe it was towards – it was somewhere in the third period, maybe midway through. I remember Dylan – I think it was Dylan Cousins. And the game is still a blur in my head because I was going crazy, stomping around, pacing around like a madman in front of my TV. Um, Ryan went off the post, and I just remember I didn't want to say it out loud, but in the back of my mind, I said to myself, Once that puck at the post, I said, You know what? We got this. I can't believe it, but we got this. But there was one little thing about Canada that I didn't bring up last week, I didn't bring up during the game, and I didn't even want to bring up after the game. I've been saving this for a week. And the one thing about Canada is this Canada sort of had the same problems that the U.S. had. 10 years ago when they were defending champions, going into the 2011 World Juniors. The U.S. was coming in as defending champions. The way the results the way the way results fell the, prior, the previous year, the U.S. really only had Finland as like, a, as like a tough opponent, and then they pretty much had three throwaway games against three weaker countries. And it was sort of the same thing with Canada. Canada had Finland as an opponent, then they had Slovakia, they had Germany, you know, they had uh, Switzerland. You know, games that were pretty much, you know, you just go out there and, you know, you're just playing around pretty much. You don't really have to put much effort to it. You know, they were up three or four goal goals early. And I think because of that, I think that might have been what hurt Canada. They didn't ha have to handle any adversity until the game where, you know, you need either the game, you know, where you need to pass that adversity and have the confidence to win. And I think that might have been Canada's undoing. Well, just that psychological, no adversity they had. They basically sailed through the tournament. And now, you know, here they are. And here they are. And the two weaknesses that they had were being, you know, we're being, what's the word I'm looking for? We're just being exposed in that game. 
So, I mean, it was definitely an upset. Maybe one of the biggest upsets in not only world junior history, but maybe international hockey history. This is a big one. This is up there with Miracle on Ice in 1980, with Belarus beating Sweden in the Olympics in 02. I mean, you name it, you know, name any game. And if you're going to name a top upset in double IHF history, world juniors, or any tournament, this is definitely one of them. It's very true. And <clears throat> for those that weren't aware, the USA beat Canada two to nothing on the back of a Spencer Knight shutout. And it can't be said enough how good he was in that. He was fantastic. Another player I wanted to highlight on Team USA was Trevor Zagris, who is a prospect for the Anaheim uh, – I almost said the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, like I'm living back in the 90s. The Anaheim Ducks. And he looked fantastic in this tournament. Him and Alex Turcott were a great pair. It's unfortunate they don't play on the same team, but they're going to be bitter rivals when they see each other from Anaheim in L.A. And – yeah, great job to the U.S. Moving right along to some key signings that happened over the course of this week as well. We had some re-signings and also some late signings to teams as well. So let's just go right down the list and then we'll pick out maybe the one of the most important ones real quick and just expand on it a little bit. So first and foremost, Sammy Votnin signing a one-year deal with the New Jersey Devils. And for those of you that are saying, hey, didn't he re-sign? No, he got traded at uh, the trade deadline last, last year by the New Jersey Devils. So they're signing him back for a relatively cheap contract. Decent signing by the Devils there. Oliver Bjorkstrand has re-signed with the Columbus Blue Jackets on a very nice five-year extension. Luke Cunin re-signs in Nashville on a two-year extension. Michael Delzato has signed a one-year league minimum deal with the Columbus Blue Jackets. Jesper Bratt has finally re-signed with the Devils on a two-year extension. I'll expand on that in a, a couple seconds. Uh, Mike Hoffman, uh, after being offered a PTO by St. Louis, has officially agreed to a one-year deal uh, with St. Louis, that is. And then finally, Lou Lamarillo has finally locked up Matthew Barzal in New York, the New York Islanders, that is, for a three-year, $7 million a year deal. Now, which one do you feel like sticks out the most here, Tom? You know what? I'm, it's, it's a tie with me between Hoffman and Barzal. Hoffman's name had been bouncing around and bouncing around and bouncing around. And unfortunately, you know, Hoffman brings a little bit of negative, a, bit, a little bit of a negative uh, history with him. He's going to St. Louis where there's already some negativity. So maybe the two negatives will make a positive or maybe the two negatives will just make St. Louis into a dumpster fire. We shall see. The Barzal deal, I really think that, you know, it, it's a good deal for them. I remember saying a few weeks ago, I said, if this Barzal deal was a one-year bridge deal, then you can forget seeing him in an Island jersey past the season. They got him inked up for three more years. We shall still see what happens with the Islanders. You know, we, we, we don't know. As I've said before, the Islanders last year, before the shutdown of COVID, were a bubble team. So will we see the Islanders of the playoffs this year? Will we see the Islanders of the regular season of last year? We don't know. But it's a smart signing bringing Barzal back. He's their best player. And, you know, hopefully um, for Islander fans, this keeps them going uh, Keeps them going on the trend they were on last year. Yeah, I agree. I think it's only good news for the Matthew Barzell re-signing in New York. Um, I do wish that he would have gotten a longer deal because you would have thought that maybe for a player of his caliber, you want to try to lock him up as long as you can. But maybe that was something that wasn't desired by Matthew Barzell. Who knows? Um, another thing I wanted to point out here was the Jesper Bratt re-signing with the New Jersey Devils. Two things about this. Number one, it's a two-year deal. And at the end of this two-year deal, he's still a restricted free agent because he didn't hit that year, uh, that age where he can be an uh, unrestricted free agent. So this was a great signing by the Devils to uh, lock him up for the next two years minimum. Uh, and then they still have his rights afterwards. I mean, obviously, you could get an offer sheet in. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention with Jesper Brat and Sammy Votnin for the Devils, for those Devils fans out there that are listening, I would not expect either of them in the opening night roster because, number one, Jesper Brat is still in Sweden right now and on his way over to the U.S. He does need to pass a quarantine period as well as four negative COVID-19 tests. And Sammy Votnin still needs to fulfill his quarantine period as well. Votnin might be in the uh, lineup a little bit sooner than Jesper Brat, maybe by a game. But they're still going to be making it into the lineup sooner rather than later. Uh 
going to go through these a little bit quicker now. So now we've got some interesting waiver claims. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Christian Juice was claimed by the Detroit Red Wings from the Anaheim Ducks. Gustav Forsling and Noah Juleson were claimed by the Florida Panthers. Uh, both are defensemen. Uh, Gustav Forsling originally coming from the Carolina Hurricane and Noah Juleson originally coming from Montreal. And there could be more claims coming in. Uh, in the coming days because today was a busy waiver day in the NHL. Probably one of the busiest uh, waiver declaration days uh, that we've ever seen in the NHL. Uh, some interesting uh, waiver declarations I'm going to read off real quick. Just a couple that you know really stick out in my mind. Uh, Calgary has uh, placed Oliver Shillington on waivers. Uh, Montreal has placed uh, Michael Froelig and Corey Perry on waivers. Both surprising. Uh, for Devils fans, Nick Merkley was placed on waivers after a really strong training camp. Uh, the Islanders, as we know, uh, put Josh Hosang on waivers, and he cleared today. They also put Andrew Ladd as well on waivers. Ottawa has uh, de- uh, placed Philip uh, Klapik on waivers as well. Philadelphia uh, put Samuel Morin on waivers. Tampa Bay Lightning put Tyler Johnson and Luke Shen on waivers. Vancouver has placed Louis Erickson on waivers. Vegas has placed Carl Dahlstrom and Nick Holden on waivers. And Winnipeg has placed Matthew Perot and Lucas Spiza on waivers. Some surprising names in there for who has been placed on waivers. Um, Tom, Give me a quick hit. Who's what name sticks out most to you? You know what? There's a few guys here actually. Um, obviously Corey Perry. He had himself a nice playoffs last year with Dallas, and I figured he'd be a nice bottom six option with Montreal. I um, can't believe they're going to let him go, but I guess it just wasn't working out up there for whatever reason. Um, Josh Hosang is like another Anthony Duclair. He's a guy that you know had a ton of upside, had a ton of potential, has had himself some decent seasons, but he just you know he can't seem to just he can't seem to put it all together. And now there's three guys I'm seeing here, Andrew Ladd, Tyler Johnson, and Louie Erickson, guys who five years ago were considered, I wouldn't say top five players, but they were noticeable players. Here we are now in 2021, and they're all looking for work. They're all looking for work, especially Johnson. I remember Johnson in that 2015 Eastern Conference Finals against the Rangers. The guy gave me nightmares. We want to put my head through a wall some nights, you know? And the same thing with Andrew Ladd. I remember Andrew Ladd was the captain of Winnipeg for the longest time. And I remember when he went back to Chicago in 16, when they reacquired him, that he was he was their their key to the promise lane. You know, that 16 team already had – they still had Hosa. They still had Kane. They still had Taves all in their prime. They still had – they didn't have Sharp at the time, I don't think. I think Sharp had already left. But they had Panarin, too, and they brought him back. And I remember bringing Andrew Ladd back. I remember everybody was basically talking about a second and second Chicago Blackhawks Stanley Cup. And ever since he's left there and gone to the island, he's just been – just hasn't been that good. And Louis Erickson, what can I say? I mean, you know, the guy was considered a uh, better option than Tyler Sagan up in Boston and, you know, bounced around a little bit too. And, you know, it, it, it's sad for these guys because five years ago, these guys were considered – these guys, people would be foaming out the mouth to have these guys. And now look where they are. It's true. The two names that I'm – not going to piggyback on either the names. I think you summed it up very, very nicely in terms of like those names that do stick out, which they do. They very much stick out in my mind. Um, Oliver Shillington sticks out as a player uh, p- being placed on waivers of kind of missed opportunity because Oliver Shillington, when he was drafted, he was drafted in the first round by Calgary not too long ago, and he was drawing comparisons to Eric Carlson. Now, when you're being compared to that, that you kind of perk your ears up a little bit and listen a little bit. Now I'm going to be curious if he ends up clearing waiver waivers for Calgary, or if maybe a team tries to you know swoop in and see if they can kind of save him and see if they can you know revive him a little bit. It is disappointing because from watching his highlights from when he was younger, he really was a blue chip prospect, and it's unfortunate to see that he has landed himself on the waiver wire. We'll see what happens. The other name that sticks out to me as a Devils fan is Nick Merkley. I thought he had a really strong training camp. I found it very surprising when I saw his name on the waiver wire. I'm kind of hoping as a Devils fan right now that he is not picked up on waivers because I have I have liked what I've seen from him. He was acquired from the Taylor Hall deal last year, and he hasn't had you know that bad of a tenure with the Devils. He's done pretty well. He's been somewhat productive, though then again, he has been on the bottom six for the Devils. He hasn't really gotten a chance to really you know thrive in the middle six yet. 
that was hopefully going to be this year, but I don't know with a waiver def- declaration, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. So, you know, we'll be giving you those quick hits on where some of these guys end up if they end up in different places next week, but we're going to move on to our main attraction for today. because Today we have our way too early award predictions for today. Now we're not going to talk about every award. If we were talking about every award, we'd be here all day. So, you know, if you want our predictions on the Jack Adams award, which goes to the coach of the year, it's not going to happen today. If you want our opinion on, you know, the Lin- the Ted Lindsay Memorial Trophy on who the players vote as the MVP, probably not going to happen because we're not any of the players in the NHL. If we were one of the players in the NHL, we wouldn't be here talking to you. But instead, we're going to give you what we feel that we can predict today uh, for the end of the year awards, which... We're also going to give you a little bit of context about each award because we do realize we do have some of uh, our fans out there that might not know what some of each of these trophies are. So we are providing you with some descriptions straight from NHL.com as well as some uh, helpful little things that I've created here. So the first trophy that we are going to be talking about here is the Calder Memorial Trophy, an annual award given to the player selected as the most proficient in his first year of competition in the NHL, selected in a w, uh, PWHA poll, or in short term, it is for the Rookie of the Year. So... Tom, I'll let you start it off. Who do you feel is going to be the Rookie of the Year this year in the NHL? Okay, well, this is going to be my first and my only homer alert. Now, I know what all you think I'm going to say. And I know what you think I'm going to say. You think I'm going to say Alexi Lafreniere, but I'm not. Not. I'm not going to do it. Not going to do it. I'm going with somebody else here. I'm going with somebody who still qualifies as a rookie, even though he played a couple games last year. I'm going with Igor Shosturkin. He, um, you know, he showed what a goalie he could be last year, had some difficulty in the minors starting, showed he could play at the NHL level, has been, from what I've read, because the Rangers have been super stingy about streaming anything from training camp, has been super stingy in training camp, has been like a brick wall in the blue-white scrimmages. I mean, I, I really think that just with, um, I'm not calling it a weak rookie class, but I'm, I'm just thinking with his experience and because he still qualifies as a rookie, I really think this is his trophy to lose this year. Just with the way he played last year, the way he's played in uh, training camp, and just, you know, with the, the, the sheer upside of the guy. I think Igor Shesterkin is my pick. I think that's a really good pick, and I do agree with you. I wanted to pick uh, highlight two other players here, though. Maybe maybe one more also. But I wanted to highlight uh, other players here because Igor Shesterkin is an easy choice there. But he's going to have competition even in net because right next door to him – you have Ilya Sorokin, who is a goaltender for the New York Islanders, who could have a chance. The only difference is Igor Shosturkin is probably going to get the majority of the play with the Rangers, whereas Sorokin is going to need to split time with Semyon Varlamov with the New York Islanders. Because of that, I don't feel like Sorokin is going to finish in the top three for the Calder Trophy. But if you ask me of who's going to win the Calder Trophy, I'm going to go with uh, Minnesota's Kirill Kaprizov. He has a great scoring touch. I think he is uh, going to be a blessing in disguise for the Minnesota Wild this year. I think he's going to only help that squad. <clears throat> and I could really see him amassing a decent amount of goals and a couple helpers to help him out. Another name I wanted to highlight here, maybe he'll finish somewhere in the Calder, Calder vote, but just a name to kind of keep your eye on. I actually believe there could be a devil that could – end up in the conversation is too. Uh, and that's uh, Yegor Sharaganovic. And he, this is a kid who's been playing KHL minutes this year and has been lights out. He has been fantastic. And then he came over for training camp and he has scored one goal or more in each scrimmage, meaning every single day and not against nobody. He's been doing it against Blackwood. He's been doing it against Wedgwood, against NHL defense, you know, whatever you want to consider it for the Devils, to be honest. But, you know, for all intents and purposes in NHL defense, he could be an exciting kid to watch in New Jersey this year. He could get some time to shine. The next trophy that we are going to talk about here is the Lady Bing Memorial Trophy. Now, this is a little bit more of an obscure 
trophy, but it'll make sense when we describe it. So the NHL description is, it is given to the player adjudged to have exhibited the best type of sportsmanship and gentlemanly conduct combined with a high standard of playing ability. In essence, with this trophy, it means that you play the game with integrity as well as you are highly respected amongst your peers as one of the top players in the league. So, Tom, who's your choice for the Lady Bing this year? Okay, before I say who my choice is going to be, two little fun facts about this trophy. One, they used to joke about it as that was the trophy they'd give to Wayne Gretzky when they couldn't give him any other ones, but they felt like giving him a trophy. They always used to joke about that, but, I mean, Gretzky won it numerous times. Another fun fact about it is is that um, way back in the 20s and the 30s, there was a player for the Rangers, their first-line center, his name was Frank Boucher, and he won it seven times in a row. And because he won it seven times in a row, they actually gave him the trophy to keep for himself and commissioned a new trophy afterwards. So just a little fun fact for you guys just to just to ponder, just to think about, you know. Um I'm going with um uh, I'm gonna go with somebody here, a little bit obvious, I guess, and a team that I've kind of been um praising a little bit here in the Toronto Maple Leafs. I'm gonna go with Austin Matthews here. I feel the Leafs will be a bigger threat. I feel like he'll be their best player, he'll be their leader, he'll be the guy they lean on. And I, I don't really think Matthews is a dirty player, he's a gentlemanly player. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give this one to Austin Matthews this year. I think really this is gonna be a good year for Toronto, and this is gonna be I mean he's good already, but this will be a year that he takes an even bigger step than the ones he's taken already, which have been the longest. Yeah, that's a good solid choice. My choice here, I said Johnny Gaudreau. And you might be a little bit surprised by that for those listeners out there. You might be surprised, like, why Johnny Gaudreau? He really hasn't done much the past year and a half. I do feel like he's going to return to his you know, top six elite level status this year. I think what we've seen over the past year has been merely an anomaly. He is a significantly better player than what he has shown the past year, year and a half. And I think he makes a comeback this year. And I think, you know, he conducts himself, you know, with such maturity that I do feel like that this is a trophy that first of all, he's won before, but I think this is a trophy that I can absolutely win again. Um, that's my opinion, of course. The next trophy that we are going to be talking about here is, for those of you that are defensive darlings, we are going to be talking about next the Frank J. Selk Trophy. Now, for context here, the Frank J. Selk, Selk Trophy is an annual award given to the forward who best excels in the defensive aspect of the game. Now, the running joke here with this trophy is it might as well just be called the Patrice Bergeron Trophy or the Pavel Datsuk Trophy because of how many times both players have kind of interchanged and won it between the two of them. But we actually do have a couple other names here that could you know, be interesting that could win it and have won it before. Um, I'm going to start with my choice here. Uh, and I'm going to say, to me, it's between St. Louis, St. Louis's uh, Ryan O'Reilly and Philadelphia center Sean Couturier. Uh, I think both have excelled in the defensive aspect of their game. Uh, both players have won this trophy before. And I feel with Sean Couturier, he's only getting better defensively. And I think he's going to find himself as the potential face of the franchise, if not Carter Hart, uh, for the Philadelphia Flyers for time for a good time to come. So for me, it's a really tough choice. I'm going to go Sean Couturier. Tom, what's your choice here? You know what? I'm going to come out of left field a little bit here. I'm going to go with Anthony Sorelli. We saw how great of a defensive pivot he, he was in the playoffs last year. And I think that really with Kucherov being out this year and with the uncertainty around Stamkos, Stamkos says he's good to go. Stamkos is most likely going to slot onto that top line with Braden Point. They're going to need Sorelli more than ever with that second line. They really are. And I really think if Sorelli can build on what he did in the playoffs last year, I really do think that this will be his trophy to win. I I, I really liked what he did, and I'm hoping he can build on it. Yeah, I agree with I agree with you there. I actually didn't think about Anthony Sorelli only because, you know, Sorelli, Sorelli has only emerged really as of the past, you know, year now. So, yeah, I agree. I think Sorelli is a really good choice. The next trophy – that we're going to be talking about here is the Vezina Trophy. The Vezina Trophy is an annual award given to the goalkeeper, a judge to be the best at this position, as voted by the general managers of all NHL clubs, or in layman's terms, this just goes to the best goaltender judged by 
general managers of all NHL clubs. So I'm going to start with this one because I want to go for a home run here. I really do want to go for a home run here. Tom, you're going to disagree with me on this one. I have a feeling. But <clears throat> call me crazy. But I'm going with Carter Hart from the Philadelphia Flyers. I think this is a season where he has a major breakthrough in his game, and he's going to be the key reason why Philly finishes first, based on my prediction from last week. And he is going to make all the difference for the Philadelphia Flyers this year. He has shown flashes of brilliance, and I think he's only getting better with time. He's only getting better, and it's going to be no time at all that we start talking about him in the same conversation with Andre Vasilevsky with Connor Hellebuck. And it's only, it's going to be this year that we start making that conversation. Uh, Tom, what's your prediction? You know what? I want to agree with you on this one. But my thing with Philly has Philly's really been night and day over the last few years. They have one season where they're really good. And then the next season, they're also rants are in last place. And everyone's wondering what happened. And unless they can break that, I can't go out here and say that this is that Carter Hart can win it. Unless they break that streak. I mean, obviously, Vino's coach now, they're a, they're a little bit of a different team. But until they prove me wrong on that, I can't sit here and say that Carter Hart's going to win this thing because Philadelphia could really crash and burn this year. And that contract they gave to Kevin Hayes, I mean, it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about to come back to one of them this year. But we haven't played any games yet. We need to see what happens. So I want to say him, but we don't know. Another guy I'm thinking about here is a guy down in Washington who's replacing Braden Holpe, Ilya Samsonov. Washington's very heavy with the with the offense, with like with their with their offense, with their offensive prowess. But their defensive prowess, I'm not sure. I'm I'm too sold on that yet. I'm really not. And I feel that if they have a big year, if they win a president's trophy, you know, if they're a first place team, you know, and they're going for their last gas by the Stanley Cup, their last gas by the contender, a lot of it's gonna be on Ilya Samsonov to perform. And if he does perform, I could easily see him being nominated. Another guy I'm going to give a nod to is Sergei Bobrovsky. If Florida has a big year this year, I could see, you know, I could see him being back in the running too. He's another guy that's on my mind. You know, even though Florida is like a, has a plethora of goaltending prospects now, as we've seen at the World Juniors last week. But, you know, if Bob Ro you know, Bobrovsky turns it off for Florida this year, that could be another guy. This is a really open-ended thing right now because there really isn't a goalie in the league right now who I'm just sitting here going, wow, this guy is he, is far and away better than everybody else. I, I just don't feel that with anybody right now. I just don't. We have to see what happens. Yeah, and we do have to see what happens. I think those are some pretty bold takes uh, by you, but it's left to be seen what happens. The next trophy, we're starting to get down the wire here. So our next trophy that we're going to be talking about is the James Norris Memorial Trophy. It is an annual award given to the defenseman who demonstrates throughout the season the greatest all-around ability in their position. So once again, in layman's terms, right now we are just talking about the best defenseman in the NHL. So Tom, I'll swing it back to you. Who's the league's best defenseman this year? I'm going with, you know, a hot commodity. One of the biggest free agent signs in the offseason, Alex Petrangelo. I really do think that he may be that missing piece in Vegas. And if Vegas wins the Stanley Cup this year, you know, and he's a big part of it, I think that Alex Petrangelo will win that Norris Trophy. You know, they sign him for a lot of money. I think they think that he's a missing piece. And if he can be that catalyst in Vegas, I think that this, that this trophy will be his at the NHL Awards. I really do Nothing more. I got nothing more to say. I just, I think it's, I really do think Petrangelo is the guy this year. I think that's a really solid choice. I, I certainly don't disagree, but I'm going to go for a home run here because Alex Petrangelo, he's an easy choice. Victor Hedman is an easy choice. You know, Victor Hedman of the Tampa Bay Lightning was the player who won it last year. So to me, I'm going to go with a home run and say Ottawa's. Thomas Shabbat. And I just think that highly of this player. I think he is a fantastic defenseman who's been buried on a bad Ottawa team. But now he's got a different lineup around him now. Ottawa has done a great job assembling quite the lineup for this upcoming year that could surprise a lot of people. And there's still some defensive deficiencies with this team. But that being said, I like 
the pair, the potential pair of him and Nikita Zaitsev. I think that could be a really strong pair this year, and I think it could give Thomas Shabbat the chance to shine. And I think he could shine very much on the back end, offensively as well, especially on the power play. So that's my home run pick for the Norris Trophy. Moving right along to our next trophy here that we're going to talk about. Now we're going to be getting into the probably the biggest trophies. And the next one that we're talking about is the next scoring trophy, which is the Maurice Richard trophy. It is an annual award given to the NHL's top goal scorer by the NHL board of governors. The winner or winners are determined based on regular season play. So the way that this is determined is whoever scores the most goals in the NHL in a given season wins the award. It hasn't been uncommon that we've seen a tie before, and we've even had a three-way tie before for this trophy. So my personal choice here, I'm gonna go. I wanted to go with the easy choice because I mean it's obvious to me. It's Alexander Ovechkin. He's going to want to come back with a vengeance and make up for lost time that he has to get to that scoring that that scoring record. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. But he wants that scoring record, and he's going to do anything he can to get that. And if that means that he's going to win the Richard again this year, he's going to gladly do that. Tom, what's your choice here? You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you here with Ovechkin. But like I've said with everything about this Washington team this year, that they're going to be a team that's going to teeter and totter and teeter and totter, and it might be the final day of the season where they win the division, and it might be the final day of the season where Ovechkin wins this. I really, really – I'm going to harken back to a guy I mentioned earlier. I really think Austin Matthews is going to be right on his tail all year, and maybe even ahead of him for, for parts of the year. You know, Matthews potted 47 in 70 games last year. You know, he probably would have walked out last year pushing 60 goals, you know. Uh, you know, another guy I could think of, and it's a little bit of homerish too. I know I said I wouldn't do that because of Banajad. I'm not I'm not as 100% sold on Mika Zibanejad as I am Austin Matthews challenging him. But I do think Ovechkin, but I could easily see Matthews and maybe Zibanejad challenging him this year too, provided Zibanejad stays healthy, of course. Yeah, and that's going to be the big key there for – you know, whoever wins the Maurice Richard is, you know, you got to stay healthy. You know, it's been very rare to see somebody not play a full season and win the Maurice Richard trophy. It has happened before, but it's very, 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 very rare for something like that to happen. Now, getting to our penultimate trophy that we're going to be talking about here, which is the Art Ross Trophy. The Art Ross Trophy is an annual award given to the player who leads the National Hockey League in scoring points at the end of the regular season. So now we're talking about a mixture of goals and assists, all totaling to total points in the NHL at the end of the season. So, Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you here. Who's your Art Ross winner? Now, I know I've been talking about Matthews taking those next steps and, you know, Austin Matthews, you know, you know, continuing on what he's doing, continuing on his trend. But there's another guy here that's in my mind that I haven't brought up yet who I also think is going to do that this year, and that guy is Nathan McKinnon. I really do think that this is the year where Nathan McKinnon steps it up and walks out with an Art Ross trophy. You know, there's a lot of love for McDavid. You know, there's still a lot of love for Crosby out there. But I really do think this is the year McKinnon really, really, you know, you know, puts his foot down, puts his, you know, stamp down in the league. I'm going with Nathan McKinnon for this one. I think that's a really solid choice. You know, the other popular choice here would be Connor McDavid, as he's done before. And there's no question of Connor McDavid's talent, talent as well as his other uh, teammate, Leon Dreisaitl, uh on the Edmonton Oilers. I'm going to make Tom happy here, and I'm going to say Austin Matthews because <laughs> – Who I didn't I, pick this time. Yeah, who you didn't pick this time <laughs> for this award. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to say that this is a year that he beats out Connor McDavid in points. I think it is highly possible that he can do it, and uh, it's going to sound dumb. It's going to sound weird, but there could be some magic that could happen between him and Joe Thornton being on the same line. I'm kind of hyped for – that line combination in Toronto. I think that could be really, really nice. Now we have gotten to our final trophy. And of course it is the most important trophy in the league. It is the heart Memorial trophy. The heart Memorial trophy is an annual award 
given to the player judged to be the most valuable to his team. The winner is selected in a poll of the Professional Hockey Writers Association in all NHL cities at the end of the regular season. Now, once again, to summarize, this is the MVP trophy in the NHL. So, Tom, I'm going to swing it over to you first because I want to go for a home run here with my pick. So I'm going to let you take the floor first. Who is your MVP? Now, I know a lot of people want us to talk about Connor McDavid, and Connor McDavid's good, but there's two other guys who I've been, you know, who I've been hearkening on this whole show, Nathan McKinnon and Austin Matthews. Now, it really depends on how far their respective teams go. If Matthews and the Leafs break that curse this year, they win that Stanley Cup, I think Austin Matthews walks away with this hard trophy. If they do not, and Colorado wins the Stanley Cup, or Colorado goes deep into the playoffs, I think McKinnon walks away with this trophy. Really depends on how far either team goes. I think it's McKinnon's to win unless the Leafs go on a run and win the Stanley Cup. Then Austin Matthews walks away with it. And then McKinnon will get the double, the Hart Ross, the Hart Ross, the Hart Ross, and the Hart Memorial, um, which is which is a big deal. A lot of guys have done that. You know, Gretzky, Lemieux. You know, you win both of those trophies, it's a big deal. I think, it, I think both names – are absolutely in that conversation between Nathan McKinnon and Austin Matthews. I think they'll absolutely be in the Hart Memorial Trophy conversation and by the end of the year. I think Connor McDavid could also be in that conversation too. But I told you and I alluded to before that I'm going for a home run here. So here we go. First things first, I need to justify by saying this. I take very much into consideration some things that were that I said as the description for the trophy. Most valuable player to your team. That being said, here's my home run pick. Buffalo fans and Frozen 4 podcast, hi to you guys. You're going to really enjoy this pick. I'm going with Jack Eichel. <laughs> and here's the reason why. I think he's going to be the biggest reason why, the, why Buffalo makes the playoffs this year. And it's going to be ironic because he's got a new teammate. His name is Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall didn't he won the Hart Memorial Trophy two years ago. And it's going to end up being for the same exact reason. He is going to out Jack Eichel, meaning he is going to outscore the majority of his own lineup and put the team on his back and route to the Stanley Cup playoffs. Now, whether or not they actually make it far in the playoffs is another thing. Keep in mind, in 2018, when Taylor Hall won the Hart Memorial Trophy. The Devils only made it to the first round. They didn't get past the first round. I think that maybe something similar could happen here to Buffalo, but that's still going to put Jack Eichel in the conversation for the Hart Trophy. I think he is going to go on an absolute tear. He's going to be a man on a mission this year. Mark my words. I think he is going to be one of the best centers in the entire league this year. And I think that this is the year that he really starts expanding that trophy case. And it expands with the Hart Memorial Trophy. But, as always, what do you guys think? Do you agree with our picks? Do you disagree with our picks? We only know when you talk to us. You can drop a comment down below. And while you're dropping a comment down below, make sure you like comment and subscribe on our video so that way you can check out more of our content here on i80 sports you know want to know where else you can check out some of our content through i80 sports you can check it out on i80 sports.com you can also because you might be asking hey brian where else can i check out i80 sports nhl i can tell you you can also check it out at i80 underscore sports nhl and you could Drop a follow, maybe drop a comment on some of the different things that I retweet on a daily basis or some of the bold takes that I have on a daily basis. I do have something new that I want to start this week for IED Sports uh, for next week, but you need to be following our Twitter so that way you can be involved in that because I definitely want to get some of the community involved in some of our future videos. And as always, make sure you follow us on Facebook at the IED Sports Discussion Group. NHL season is upon us on Wednesday. I'm hyped. Tom's hyped. I'm Brian. He's Tom. This has been I80 Sports NHL. <laughs>